Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Amina. For those of you that don't know, I completed a PhD in cell and developmental biology, more specifically into cancer research and looking at the different proteins in the membrane of a cell. Um, so I do have a little bit of experience reading research papers and trying to understand them and not just that but trying to disseminate them to non-science readers and the public. I've done a little bit of science journalism as well so I have some experience in being able to read a science journal and look at a paper and try to make it make sense for those that don't have a science background at all. I thought it would be a really good idea to scan through the biomedical literature. I looked at pubmed.com and you are able to and you're free to go and look at that as well. I'll leave the links for everything that I mentioned down below. So I went onto there and I searched for research that's been published and peer-reviewed um, of articles about fasting Ramadan and what health benefits that brings to you. So for those who don't know, Ramadan is a month where Muslims fast between 20 to 30 days, so the whole month of fasting, um, and it's complete dry fasting. So from dawn to sunset, Muslims fast, no water, yes no water, uh, no food, nothing. There are many people that are exempt from fasting for various health reasons, um, but for healthy individuals, uh, fasting is compulsory. There's been a lot of research, especially in the past kind of decade, to understand how uh, fasting helps in a health perspective. And this research is used especially for clinicians, so doctors that are in contact with patients every single day need to be able to advise their patients whether fasting is gonna be something that's gonna be detrimental to them. So there's some research that is done on healthy people um, and that's just to see the effects of fasting and there's some research that has been done on those that have illnesses so those that might have diabetes or those that might have um, cardiovascular issues or those that might be pregnant for example um, and usually these groups of people are exempt from fasting because they do need to take medication and especially in the UK now we're fasting for 18 hours so it's quite a long time to not be able to take medication if you are someone who is medicating I'm gonna leave all the links for all the papers down below they are all free to access if you can't access them you can read the app Tracks, which is a bit like a blurb so you can read that and you can see um, what the main findings were and what their aims and objectives were there is so much research out there that discusses the benefits of fasting um, as absolutely there's a plethora of research it's insane I really struggle to select four or five but I just tried to choose papers that I think were easy to understand firstly easy for me to <laughs> to, to communicate and also um, a bit different, so different to the typical benefits that you might be hearing when you hear, oh, Ramadan is amazing for this. So the first paper that I want to talk about is this paper. So this is paper published actually just this year, 2019. And again, like I said, I like to look at papers that are quite recent than papers that have that, that are really old and have been disputed. So this is a very recent paper. So psoriasis is actually a chronic systemic inflammatory recurrent disease that affects approximately 2% of the population worldwide um, and is quite a burden in terms of cost and also health related perceived quality of life. Um, so 2% of the population, so it's quite a bit worldwide. And so what they did was they wanted to look at um, how fasting Ramadan helps with psoriasis. So this PASI index is actually an index that they looked at to be able to compare before and after and the skin condition. The way that this research was carried out was they've split the body up into four different sections so they said the head the upper limbs the trunks and the lower limbs they then took scores from each of those sections individually before the fasting and then they looked at the scores after the fasting and what they found was this very interesting graph so i'll put it on the screen over here but they found there's a statistically significant decrease in this score after fasting and this graph very clearly shows you that there's a dip from before fasting to after fasting by dividing this the body into different parts they were able to characterize the skin in the different parts of the body and it's characterized by a dermatologist and I think they had I believe they had three um, they had two reviewers so two dermatologists look at it initially and then a final dermatologist if there was any discrepancies however they also looked at fasting and the use of drugs and they found that there was a much much bigger difference with fasting and the use of drugs than drugs alone or than fasting alone this this research goes into quite a lot of depth actually into circadian rhythms and how the your sleep wake cycle changing because of fasting has a big impact on psoriasis and uh, the characteristics of it and if you want to look into it a bit more uh, it's beyond the scope of this video you can go and check it out I'll leave the links for it down below um, but actually what they, what they concluded were two things firstly there's no risk of fasting uh, for psoriasis in particular um, and secondly using so fasting actually helps decrease 
the, the score, that the index they were looking at, um, and more so with the use of drugs. This is the first paper that looked at diet, and they said that they, there have been some studies that have tried to look at diet, but it's always been shut down. But this is the first one that's actually specifically looked at the impact of diet um, and the lack of, of, of food as a potentially in, important factor in helping uh, to treat psoriasis. There, is, there are limitations to every single study. There is no study out there that has not got a limitation that you can discuss. And the limitation of this paper is that they were unable to monitor the dietary intake outside of the fasting period. So when we're fasting outside of those 60, like 18 hours now, where we can eat and drink whatever we want, um, and this paper did not look at what people were eating and drinking. So there could be someone that is eating amazing food, really healthy food, high in nutrition, but it could be someone who's having junk food and they weren't able to really... The second health benefit that I want to talk about is skin aging. Again, this is something I've never ever heard before. I've never heard that fasting can help your skin age better. This summary image that you're gonna see on the screen right now. So you can see that your, your skin is made up of the cuticle, which is the top layer, epidermis, the dermis, hypodermis, and you go down. Whereas with aging skin, you can see the cuticle is a lot more elastic, there's more skin. Your skin actually has less elastin and less collagen, which are used to keep the skin taut. It's usually in younger skin keeps the skin tight. Whereas when you've got the lack of elastin and the lack of collagen, your, your skin kind of droops a little bit and that's how you end up with wrinkles and very thin skin. This product that I cannot pronounce, so carboxymethylysine, takes back to my uni days, CML, and also pentacidine, these two products actually cause the skin to age more, and they're natural products, um, but they do cause the skin to age more by accumulating in the skin as you get older. However, what they found was fasting causes a decrease in CML and a decrease in pento, I'm just gonna call it pento, a decrease in pento. So by decreasing these two products, what happens is the skin is accumulating them much slower, and so it's not aging as quickly. So the next paper looked at the effects of fasting on two proteins, insulin growth factor 1, so IGF-1, interleukin-2, so IL-2. They play an essential role in pathophysiology of a number of different diseases, including diabetes, cancer, and also macular de degeneration, so that's your eyes. It looked at whether these proteins have been increased or decreased um, during normal dance, so when you're fasting, is there an impact on these proteins? And the question was, if it happens in animals, does that also happen in humans? Because you cannot simply say, okay, we've found this in, in, a, in, a, in a rat, we found this in a mouse, it, that's going to happen in humans. Our body systems are completely different, they're, they're complex in different ways. So you do have to make sure that you test in humans as well. So this was a, a paper that wanted to check for humans um, after having uh, confirmed that it, it does decrease in animals. What they found was actually fasting causes your body to go into survival mode, instead of directing the energy into growth and parts of your body that doesn't really need it, it instead directs the body processes into survival. So for example, it stops IGF-1 uh, from increasing, it stops the protein concentration from increasing. So they say that the findings of this study were indicative of significant reduction of IGF-1 levels over the course of intermittent fasting in Ramadan. So intermittent fasting, they mean that we're eating and then not eating and eating and not eating. Um, it seems that short periods of starvation, even less than 12 hours, influence hormonal responses in the human body. So it, depending on which area you are in the world, um, we fast in the UK for 16 hours, but some parts of the, of the world fast for 12 hours or even less than that. But actually, even short periods of starvation influence a hormonal response. That's insane. And they've also tried to interestingly link this in with insulin. It is very well known that calorie restriction or um, fasting in general decreases insulin levels and because you are having less sugar, obviously. And they've tried to understand the link between insulin and IGF-1. It's quite an interesting link. So they've said that this association between calorie restriction and reduced IGF-1 production may be explained by insulin. So what happens is when you fast, you're decreasing your insulin. And by decreasing insulin, you're actually decreasing IGF-1 because they do have a relationship, they have an association. So that's very interesting as well, actually. Um, and like I said, if you want to go into more depth, and there's loads of other papers that you can read about this, feel free, I'll leave a link for this paper down below. This paper is titled, Ramadan Fasting Improves Liver Function and Total Cholesterol in Patients with Non-Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease. This, was, this paper was looking at patients that had um, fatty, fatty liver disease, but from not from alcohol. So they were Muslim patients, so the disease came from other lifestyle or, or genetic issues as opposed to um, alcohol consumption. What does, what does Ramadan do when you fast? What, what happens to the liver and the function? I also wanted to look at the adiposity index, which means how much fats there are 
um, the, or the level of fat in the liver as well. They found that the fasting group were actually seemed to be improving much quicker than the non-fasting group and there was a much more significant impact on fasting on liver, on the liver disease. Again, like I said, this is just one paper. It was published in April 2019. It's published like two months ago, like last month basically. Um, so it is a very new recent paper. I think it was still quite, it's still quite an interesting paper. Um, and I think it, it shows you another twist and another impact that Ramadan actually has. The last paper that I wanted to talk about is this one. I think it's a really interesting one. Um, the effects of fasting on emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence in this paper is defined as the ability to interpret the role of emotions and sentiments in human, human capabilities and um, helps you essentially decide what it is that you want to do and based on the environment and, and the cues around you. Um, so you can react to environmental factors and pressures appropriately and cause optimal performance in four domains. So four main domains is what is encompassed by um, emotional intelligence. Firstly, self-awareness. Secondly, social awareness. Thirdly, relationship management. And lastly, self-management. I think it's quite interesting. Um, we just take, I think we just we take emotional intelligence for granted, but um, it is it is something that you learn as you grow up and it is something that you are not born with you definitely learn it as you mature so what this paper found was that the Ramadan actually helps you delay your emotions a little bit and rethink so what they found were people were less angry you need to control your your desires like food is one of the biggest desires uh, the fact that you need to control that desire means that you're kind of learning how to control you're learning how to self-manage you're, le you're learning how to manage your relationships because you might have someone around you that is eating so you need to be able to you know control that relationship and under and and have an understanding between each other. This is a very interesting graph that I'm about to show you. So you can see um, number one here shows uh, the emotional intelligence before fasting. So I believe it's one week before fasting. Then number two shows um, at the completion of, so that's at the end of Ramadan. So when we finished fasting, they tested uh, emotional intelligence and then they tested it one month after. <laughs> it's quite an interesting graph because it literally goes, yep, and then nope. I think it reflects reality really, you know, we form all these habits and we really have the um we want to we want to change and we, we want to get better and then after we have to after we stop fasting after we've lost that that need to self-control we go back to our old habits it kind of reinforces the idea of having to reset every year so we've got to sort of every single year so we're able to reset every single year they actually gave them a, a test for them to sit um, and they tested all these things and then they were able to add them up and, and make, it, make it into a mean to be able to score it because it's quite hard to be able to test someone's optimism um, without just giving them a questionnaire and trying to figure it out but I thought it was quite an interesting paper um, again you can see here in this table that I'm, I'm going to show you, in this graph that I'm going to show you again you can see the first stage, the second stage and the third stage the red is the is the second stage which is the, the impact of Ramadan at the end and it's always the highest <laughs> but it's just interesting how after it just goes back down and I, I love that, I love that it goes down again because it just it reinforces the idea that we need this every single year we need it to be able to reset but yeah, uh, that's the end of this video it's, it's probably going to be a bit of a long one <laughs> I haven't really gone into that much depth and like I've said before, this is not a conclusive paper, this is not a conclusive review, um, I've just described one paper that is by no means conclusive, is by no means um, information that you need to take and run with. Uh, it's just an example of the kind of research that is going on out there um, for those that don't have a, maybe a science background and um, the kind of research that is out there that's based and trying to understand Amazon a bit more and trying to give health practitioners um, and medical practitioners a better understanding of what people that are fasting go through and the needs that they that they that they require during this month. By the time you see this video, there's probably going to be like two three days left of Ramadan, which is insane. Um, but I really hope that you've had a good one, and I really hope that you feel that benefit. Um, I definitely feel lighter. I feel much more kind of. I know agile <laughs> and I really hope to be able to continue intermittent fasting after Ramadan I've been doing it for a while now anyway but um, I really want to make sure that I continue it because I there's a huge huge wealth of um, information and a huge wealth of research that is very beneficial that really points towards the benefits of intermittent fasting and just restricting your calories and just not being you know eating whatever and whenever um, so if you want to know a bit more about intermittent fasting I'm happy to do a video on that as well don't forget to follow me on my social media my Instagram app my Instagram app will be up there and don't forget to press subscribe on my channel and I'll see you guys in the next video bye